Welcome to Magic is Real, and thank you for being here. I'm your host, Shannon. I'm a psychic medium, and I have with me today Wendy Rose Williams death experiencer and she's a past life energy healer and she's here today to share with us a story about reincarnation she's been on the podcast before so if you haven't seen it check out that previous episode to hear her near-death experience uh today she'll talk about her work in a sense of, of um, being a past life regressionist as it pertains to her story today. So if you like this podcast, please subscribe, like, and leave comments below. It makes all the difference. It's a way that you can support the podcast for free. And without further ado, here's Wendy Rose Williams. Thank you so much for being here today, Wendy. Oh, it's my pleasure, Shannon. I'm just so glad to get to uh, share this story. I think that the timing is just perfect. And what I'd like to talk about is how to stop haunting yourself. And yes. share with you one of the wildest experiences I have had. And what happened, this goes all the way back to uh, what started happening was when I first was newly married and I was a newlywed out in the Boston area. We had the good fortune to purchase a home uh, north of Boston in Boxford, Massachusetts. And the time period was uh, fall of 1989. And we actually purchased and moved into this large colonial that had been um, empty, um, had been uh, unoccupied for about a year. And so just so much excitement, you know, purchasing the first house, newlywed, and it was February of 1990. And my husband uh, traveled a lot at the time. He traveled extensively on business. So I was fine with that. You know, I just was independent and loving the new house and getting things set up. But what started happening from almost the very first night that he was gone was was quite remarkable. And I went to bed, you know, just you, you go through your, your evening routine and lock up the house and turn off the lights and go to bed. And I'm just happy and in the glow of the new marriage and the new house and property and feeling so fortunate with all that. But what happened was I woke up right at midnight because I had the digital clock next to the bed. And what I could hear was footsteps coming up the stairwell and our um, primary bedroom was right at the top of the stairs to the right. Now this scares the bejesus out of me because I'm home alone and we lived on, uh, Boxford is a two acre minimum uh, town. So everyone's got these large lots and lots of beautiful trees and you, you're far from everybody. It uh, gives a uh, in cold blood vibes when you're telling the story. <laughs> Uh, haven't seen that don't want to see it yeah <laughs> is it considered thriller it's Truman Cap it's Truman Capote's book about a real life murder that happened to a family oh. that was out in the middle of nowhere on okay. a farm okay. not to be grim but that's just okay. sort of so the vibe this really really scared me so I'm going through in my mind what do I do because the bedroom door was closed but it didn't have a lock on it I don't have a telephone in that bedroom and also it was really quite high up it's not like I could just get out of the window so I'm like going through what do I do what do I do because I hear these footsteps and I got up, I, I crept out of the bed as quietly as I could, and I shoved um, a straight chair underneath the doorknob, because it was all I could think of to do. And the footsteps just stopped. So that was actually kind of worse. <laughs> I'm like, what do I do? Is there someone in the house? Is there not someone in the house? So I waited silently with bated breath just you know ready to again like try and hold that door closed and not sure what I was going to do if someone did did break in I mean it was just petrifying it's one of the scariest experiences I've had in my life so silence for 15 minutes and it's like okay well I clearly cannot just go back to bed I've got to secure the house and make sure that there's no one else in the house so I creep out of the bedroom and I'm thinking, okay, where's the nearest phone in case I have to barricade myself in another room and call 911. And so I've like worked that out in my head and I come out, 
nothing. I hear nothing. I can just sense that there, there's, I can, you can just tell, you know, I just tuned into the, there's, there was no one else in the house. So I went through the whole house, checked it all, made sure there was no broken window. All the windows are locked. Uh, you know, all the doors had been locked. Everything was fine. And we had a fresh snow. So I even um, turned the lights on, the exterior lights on, and I looked outside and there's no footsteps in the snow. I'm like, well, clearly no one was here. So what were those footsteps? So I locked the house all up again and go back to bed, have a very, very uneasy night. And I fall right back into a dream. And this had actually started as a dream, but it very quickly became lucid and then went past lucid into I'm wide awake. And I had pinched myself really hard on my, my inner uh, left arm, like, am I awake? Yeah, yeah, I'm really awake because I, I had a little um, bruise there the next day. So I knew I was wide awake. I had not just dreamed this episode because I had the mark on my arm. And what happened is I fell back into this uneasy sleep was the dream just resumed, but it went further. And again, it's very, very lucid. I'm wide awake. And what I'm seeing is the, the house just fall away. The house is gone. And I can see this large rock. And I can see, at more than seeing her, I can just sense this heartbroken uh, young female ghost um, from colonial America. And I knew she was in colonial American times because she had the hallmark, the little white apron over her outfit and the little white kerchief uh, covering her hair. So I knew, oh, that's colonial American times. But Shannon, the heartbreak from her, she was just devastated. And she kept trying to uh, climb up this big rock and she would climb up on it. And then she would look to the east toward the water. And I knew she was waiting for her beloved to come. I knew she was waiting for her man to come and that he was going to come um, over, over the water, but he wasn't coming. And she just felt so stuck. And I felt so much empathy for her. I felt so sorry for her, but I didn't know what to do. I had no idea how to help her. It was 1990. Uh, I was an MBA. I had no spiritual or energy awareness or practice. It was, you know, before the times when you could Google, what do I do with a broken, broken hearted ghost in my yard? <laughs> it just, it just wasn't that time period. And I didn't have any of those contacts or connections. I didn't have a single friend who was a psychic medium. I didn't know to call in angels to help her. So I just, I didn't know what to do. So I get up the next morning and ever practical, I, I call a locksmith <laughs> and I ask the locksmith um, to put a lock on my bedroom door because this experience was so frightening. So he was very obliging. He's like, sure, you know, what time do you get off work? I can meet you there at, you know, six o'clock and we'll put a lock on your door. Fine. So we did that. So I went to bed the next night, feeling more confident, feeling more comfortable with whatever this experience was that was going on. And I, you know, locked up the house and locked my bedroom door. Same thing. I go to sleep and I, I sleep, um, I sleep fine for a while. And then I wake up right at midnight again. And the footsteps are coming um, up stairwell. But this time I wasn't as scared because I'd had some experience with it the night before had that lock on the door. Cause I'm trying to sort out, is this, energy is this a ghost is this some is there a person you know an actual physical person breaking into the house I've got more confidence now with that lock on the bedroom door and again I can just I, the house falls away and I'm seeing the same scene it's very repetitive and she just felt so stuck and I tried to talk to her and to you know, ask her what, what she needed and why she was there. And I could feel, I could feel the time uh, just going back, you know, definitely was because my house isn't there anymore. Our house was only 20 years old and I could see the trees were, were much smaller. It just, it just really felt like time 
you know, went went back to her her time period. But I don't know what to do with her. I don't I, I don't feel like I'm effectively communicating with her. And I'm not enjoying this experience <laughs> night after night after night. So um, this this goes on for um, for uh, the rest of the rest of the week and my husband comes home and I try and share with him what's going on and he just gives me the look like Wendy what are you talking about there's no such thing as ghosts this is ridiculous this doesn't make sense you know we're educated people we don't believe in ghosts hmm okay so but like I said my belief system just I, I didn't understand I didn't have an appreciation for everything that's uh, going on and that is so magical uh, in in our worlds and all the different different aspects of it but that's where I was as a 28 year old uh, newlywed and so he's trying to help me problem solve a little bit he's like you must just be anxious about you know being home alone and we don't have a we don't have a um uh, an alarm on the house and we don't you know you don't have a phone handy so that's great you put the lock on the door so you're fine and that was kind of the last of he wanted of what he wanted to discuss with it so I had to let it go um, with him I tried talking to my mother and she had very much the same reaction that it was my problem and I must be anxious and worried about something and why couldn't I you know see the joy in, in my life uh, which I certainly did but that didn't negate what was happening and it was very real and it was very powerful and I just didn't have anyone to assist me with it so this went on Shannon for the entire three and a half years that we lived in the home huge validation would come in the form of guests that stayed overnight because we love to entertain we love to uh, have people come out and visit us in Boston and we had a large home, so it was great to uh, have people come, you know, stay for the weekend, uh, stay for whatever, whatever time period. Three different friends, um, the first night after they slept in the house, and they were there at different times, and I said not a word to any of them about that, because what I learned from trying to share this twice was it didn't land well. So... Um, I just asked my my good hostess questions the next you know the next night after one of my best friends was there um, who I'd known since I was eighteen and she was visiting and I asked her you know how'd you sleep did you do you have enough blankets do you need more towels you know are you comfortable and she said oh Wendy I've got to tell you I had the most vivid dream last night and there is this heartbroken young colonial american ghost she's in her late teens or early 20s and she's stuck on your property she just keeps going up this rock and she's looking toward the east and she's waiting for her lover and he just never comes my jaw is on the floor shannon because i'd said nothing to her about this experience so how does she have the same dream? How does she have the same experience? Obviously, there was some real stuck energy uh, in that area. There absolutely was a ghost on my property um, that, that none of us, unfortunately, knew how to help. So same thing happens um, a while later. I uh, have a cousin uh, who visits uh, from out of town, and she and her husband are there. And same thing, you know, how'd you guys sleep? And I did have just um, just my cousin aside. Her husband wasn't there right then, nor was, was mine. And I asked her and she said, oh, Wendy, this dream I had, oh my goodness. And she goes through the same exact story. And again, I'm like, wow. And it happened again. And again, I had told her nothing. And she didn't know, you know, she didn't know the other friend. They weren't there at the same time. And then it happened again a third time with a, uh, a close friend of my husband's uh, who had been a, a former boss and had become a really uh, good friend. Same thing, the first time he slept in our house. Um, in fact, he had an experience with that ghost multiple times, um, different, different nights that he was there. So there just was a lot of uh, validation coming in, but again, didn't know, just didn't know to tell her kindly. Um, that she was dead, that she didn't have a body anymore, that she was loved and supported and absolutely deserved to go up to the light 
and that there were so many uh, angels that would help her and that, you know, we could just, just help get her on up to the light that she needed to go home. She needed to go there to let go of whatever had so upset her in this lifetime. She needed to let go of it uh, from the 1600s. My goodness, what a long time to be stuck as a ghost. So, but none of us, none of us had that, had that knowledge. So uh, what happened next was uh, we, we relocated, we moved um, across the country and we moved from the Boston area out to Seattle. And as we were moving, I'm like, gosh, I would really love to be able to help her and clear this property. But again, I just, I just didn't know, I didn't know what to do. So uh, we moved and I tried to uh, forget about the experience. I just, I didn't know what to make of it. I didn't know what to, what to do with it. So we moved in um, 1993 and I tried to just, uh, just, just bury it, as I said, because I just didn't seem anything further I could do with it. And I figured it was just some odd thing, you know, related to that, that property. And I just, I just moved on. 20 years later, it's 2013. And we had been uh, living and enjoying uh, Seattle's uh, east side. And um, one of my uh, best friends in Seattle calls me. And she says, are you sitting down? I have to tell you a story. I'm like, oh, I'm sitting down now. <laughs> and never, then never what you want to hear when you, when you get a phone call. And at, by 2013, I was much more um, spiritually awake. I'd had a lot of um, experiences in the interim in those 20 years. And I could clearly hear my guides by 2013. I was blessed with that ability. And my guides, the minute she said, I have something to tell you, they said, deepest truth, deepest truth, sit down. You can hear this now. You're ready for this now. And what she shared with me was an odd experience she had where she had gone to the bookstore and she wanted to buy the latest uh, Brian Weiss title. And instead, she said when she was in the bookstore that this book got her attention in a really, um, really wild way. I can't remember if it um, fell off a bookshelf, like right at her feet, or if she just, you know, saw it um, on the, you know, wherever in the store. But she's like, I had to buy this book. The minute I picked up this book, and it was called Sacred Spaces. And it was about how to clear uh, your home and property. And she thought, well, that's weird. You know, why would I need this book? This, my home doesn't have any energy issues. This is weird. But she said it was like that book was just glued to her hands. So she knew to buy it. So she bought it. She got home. Same thing. She went to, uh, you know, just toss it on the counter because kids were getting ready to come home from school. And she said she couldn't put it down. It was literally like glued to her hands. She thought, okay, I've got to speed read for something real quick here before the, before the bus comes. So she looked through the chapter headings and she saw a chapter on how to uh, clear your home from a ghost. So she did some speed reading of it, looked, looked it through, and then went back to it uh, later that night and read it, read it more thoroughly. So two or three days later, uh, her dog wakes her up in the middle of the night. You know how animals can just stare at us? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> and get us to, to wake up in the middle of the night. So she said she feels she feels this stare from her dog and she thinks, oh my gosh, the dog must need to go out. That's unusual during the middle of the night. And she said she looked at the clock and it was like midnight straight up. She's like, okay. So she's like tippy toeing out of bed, trying not to wake up her husband and not wake up her, her children. And she goes to take the dog out through the sliders um, into the, the fenced backyard, but the dog won't go. And instead, the dog runs into um, her family room, which is just off, off the kitchen. And it's barking and barking and keeps looking up at something on the ceiling. And it's just barking and like trying to chase something while looking up at the ceiling. So she looks up. And she said she saw and felt this heartbroken specter. And it was a young female. And she just, she said she had to work and work and work. She said it was so heartbroken. She almost got sucked into that energy herself. She said it was hard to even stay in her body and stay grounded and say, hey, you don't belong here. 
So with the greatest of empathy, but firmness, she then went through, she said it took her like half an hour to clear this ghost out of her home using the information that she had just read in sacred spaces. And she just talked with the ghost and told her she didn't have a body and she needed to go home to the light and she would be assisted and that she needed to go home. She could not be in my friend's home. She did not have permission to be there and to get out right now and go outside and going up to the light. So she's telling me all this and I'm like, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I know what's coming. And the punchline was she told me um, as kindly as she could, Wendy, that ghost is you and you need to clean up your energy from colonial America. And I know this sounds crazy. I didn't know this until I had this experience, but evidently, and I was started finishing her sentences. I said, oh my gosh, you were my best friend at Plymouth Plantation. You lived right next door to me. We were friends for a lifetime. And I so appreciate you telling me this. And I said, I absolutely want to clean up my energy, but I have no idea what's the protocol <laughs> for sending your own ghost home. I did not know that you could be here fully incarnated, having your life, living your life and be haunted by your own ghost. So I then shared with her, and I've never told her um, the experiences I'd had um, 20 plus years ago when I was living um, out in Boston before we'd met. And we're like, oh, this just the puzzle pieces are just coming in faster and faster and faster. This all makes perfect sense. It's I've evidently got some heartbreak or some unfinished business from that lifetime, and I need to uh, clean it up because this is not okay to be going and bothering friends and waking up friends in the middle of the night and all the effort, you know, that, that she had to go through. So I apologize to her for being, you know, the unwanted uh, visitor. Um, but it kind of made perfect sense that I would go to a friend who had been a friend in that same lifetime. And I later would learn a few days later that one of my best friends, um, one of my other best friends, she um, was was um, at home alone. And same thing, you know, very similar to me securing my my property um, back in back in Boxford when I was a newlywed. She said, you know, I, I locked everything up for the night and her husband was away on a business trip. And she's like, I set the alarm and I went to bed, you know, everything was great. You know, kids are asleep. And, and but she said the alarm tripped and scared the heck out of me. And I had to get up and turn off the alarm and go through, you know, settle, settle the boys down, settle her two sons down, say, we're okay, everything's fine. I don't know why the alarm tripped, but there's no problem. There's no intruder in this house. And, you know, they secured everything and went back to bed. It was the same night. It was that same night that my um, other friend was, was chasing me in my ghost ghost uh, form out of her house. I also evidently went to the other friend for help. For help. I think I went there next. Um, so uh, embarrassed, uh, chagrined, obviously I need to uh, clean this up. So I thanked my uh, friends um, and said, I will, I'll figure this out and I'll take care of business. So by that time, it's 2013, and I had two good friends who were psychic mediums. And I went to both of them separately and I did not share very much at all because I wanted to give them, you know, room to connect and validate. And, but I just gave them a sentence or two and said, uh, is it possible that I'm haunting myself? Because there appears to be a ghost. And then they're like, oh, wow, colonial America. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's you. Oh, wow. Wow. Heartbreak, heartbreak. So they're validating it all. I said, okay, great. Well, got that straight. <laughs> How the heck do I get her up to the light? How do I get her to go home? And both my friends looked at me and they're like, oh, wow, interesting question. Like, I know how, and both of them said, you know, I know how to clear a home or business or property or whatever from, from spirits, from ghosts that, you know, shouldn't be there and that need to go on up to the light. But I don't know how to do it with a person who's standing here asking me the question. <laughs> yeah. It's your ghost. <laughs> I'm like, you, you, 
you don't have any recommendation and they're like no so the first friend did not and the second friend um you know kind of same conversation with her um and then she said oh but I do know someone that might be able to help you I'm like good because <laughs> I just don't know what to do and she referred me to a spiritual teacher who then would become my first uh, spiritual teacher and what happened was I booked an appointment with a spiritual teacher and my friend told me that she specialized in ghosts and was wonderful with ghosts and would be able to uh, help me. So I'm like, fantastic. So uh, it then I, I called to get the appointment for a healing session with her. And it took about three weeks to actually get scheduled, you know, trying to juggle, juggle schedules together and to get, to get an opening. And, um, by the time I had that appointment with the spiritual teacher, uh, I had actually been able to figure out how to send my own ghost uh, back to back to the light. So what I did was I was telling a, another friend, I was telling uh, my former boyfriend um, about this, and he'd been telling me another story about one of his past lives. And all of a sudden, the two things came together. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, my gosh, here you are talking about many lives as a sea captain. And you're talking about um, a former um, girlfriend um, of yours in this lifetime who was just really uh, angry with you for abandoning her in that past life. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And a whole bunch of puzzle pieces kicked in. And I'm like, uh, guess what? I just figured out why she's so heartbroken and why she's so stuck here and why we needed to meet again. And he looked at me, he says, oh boy, yeah, I got it too. I have a feeling I was the sea captain for you also. And that was exactly what had happened. And I was able to figure it out. I even found the historic record, Shannon, which shocked me because I didn't wow. know that there were historic records going back. But as I put the pieces together and I just started writing down everything that was coming through in meditation, everything my guides were saying, all the pieces of the puzzle, it was pages and pages of figuring this out. And I was remembering something my grandfather had said to me in um, back in college. He had done, uh, he and my grandmother had done a lot of genealogy research and he told me in college and he just had this intense look on his face it was just he and I alone um, out out in Florida where they lived out in their their Florida room and he said you always need to remember that you came over on one of the Mayflower ships and I thought you know I was in college I didn't really care about genealogy that much and I thought he meant that our family had you know come over because that's true the Elliots did come over um, and he had been able to, you know, show the genealogy. But as I'm sitting here in, in 2013, I'm like, oh, one of the Mayflower ships. I get it now. So what I was able to piece together and put together um, working with my former boyfriend and with my with my girlfriend who'd been there at me with Plymouth Plantation, I'm like, oh, this is just crazy. Uh, to have this all coming up, but they were helping me put the pieces together so that I could take care of business and get her, get her um, back to the light. So another major piece that would click in was an unrelated um, friend of mine, um, a, a male friend, invited me to go to this love and light party. And I didn't know what that was. It sounded intriguing. He says, well, tell me more about it. He says, well, I've just been to one before, and there's this woman there, um, and she draws, she has the ability, she has a beautiful uh, gift, uh, intuitive gift that she can draw people in a past life. And she can do this like quick sketch um, and just see, you know, you don't tell her or ask for anything. She just tunes into your energy and she draws you in a past life. So we went um, together um, to, that, to that party and there were uh, maybe 10 or 12 people there and it was incredible, Shannon. She was able to draw me in a past life. And it was in that past life that I was so struggling uh, to heal and release and to get my ghost home from. And the moment I saw that, just like this sad little face, and this was from the 1600s. And I mean, you don't have, there's no cameras and you don't yeah. have 
portraits done of you unless you're, you know, very wealthy or, you know, I mean, it was rare, but to get to see her face, it was a big deal. And that wonderful um, gal uh, just gave me this, you know, like mini reading with it of, of what had what had gone wrong and some some suggestions for how to let go of that energy and how to heal it and release it. It got even more amazing from there because I could kind of understand how she could have this beautiful gift and be working with someone in person where you're having a conversation and you're together. But what happened next was even wilder. So I thought, well, okay, you know, I've got my sketch. I go on home. You know, I'm not likely to ever see her again. What happened was I did, um, we did become Facebook friends. So what comes up next a day or two later in my Facebook feed is this picture. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it was another past life sketch she had done. And she had posted it on Facebook saying, I don't know who this belongs to but I'm hoping um, someone will recognize it and step up for it. So what it was, it was a picture of my best friend from that lifetime, the one that had had to clear me out of her house and had told me um, that the ghost was me. And I knew I was looking at her in that lifetime, but I thought, well, maybe that's just my opinion. So I, I took a picture of it and I uh, texted it to my friend and I said, I just came across this sketch. What do you think? I didn't say anything else. I didn't say where it come from. I didn't say I thought it was her. And she texted me back in a nanosecond and said, oh my God, how did you get a sketch of me from my lifetime in at Plymouth Plantation with you? Where did you get that? So there was the confirmation. It was, it was pretty huge. So I, of course, um, you know, shared that, shared that with her. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. So I went back to the intuitive artist who'd drawn it. And I was like, how, how did you do that? And she says, I don't know. I just, you know, clear my energy. And, and that's my gift. I'm able to draw um, these. And sometimes it's the person themselves in the past life. Sometimes it's their guide. Sometimes it's someone else that was in that lifetime. So Shannon, it then happens twice more. And at that point, we're kind of joking. Do you work for me full time? <laughs> Because again, she posted sketches on Facebook because she didn't know who they, she wasn't sitting with anyone. She's just at home at night, relaxing, you know, watching TV or whatever. And she just gets this feeling that she's supposed to draw a sketch. So the next sketch she drew was of Captain William Pierce. And just, I knew the name because what she put on Facebook was this man was very well known. I don't know who he is. And many people are going to try and claim this sketch. So you need to be able to tell me who was, and she named um, one of his brothers. She said, you know, who was so-and-so to this man? And the person who can answer that correctly, you're meant to have the sketch. So I just meditated and just went in and I was like, oh, wow. Okay. I, I, I see. And that's, that's how I, got his name because I knew the brother's name. I hadn't known that ahead, but it just came through in the meditation. And so I let her know, I said, this was uh, Captain William Pierce. And he was, he became known as the ferryman of the North because he brought the most people uh, successfully over from uh, England and Europe um, over to, over to America. He was bringing them to uh, the early settlers, the first settler, bringing them to uh, Plymouth Plantation in what would become Massachusetts, as well as down to, um, in, in Virginia, to Jamestown. So I explained that to her and she's like, okay, that's absolutely your, your sketch. So um, she mailed that to me and I took a, a picture of it and I then shared it with different friends, same thing. I'm like, oh, I have this interesting sketch, you know, who, does it remind you of anyone was all I said. I didn't say it was past life sketch. I didn't say who I thought it was or where it was from. Shannon, I think 10 different people named my former boyfriend and said, oh, wow, that really looks like um, so-and-so. Because, you know, at that point, we we had a, you know, a fairly large shared circle of friends that that knew both of us and they all named him. And then I gave it to, I gave it to him and he said, oh, wow, that's me as a sea captain. And that was, you know, kind of the, kind of the extent of what, what he knew of it. 
one more uh, sketch came through from that lifetime and that one turned out to be um, of my husband in this lifetime who I knew very briefly at Plymouth Plantation so I now had four sketches from that lifetime it was just mind-blowing how much information there was um, coming coming through so I sat with my former boyfriend and I told him what had happened and why um, I had been able to figure out uh, my name um, by that by that um, time. And I told him my name had been Ann Warren and I had um, eventually married Thomas Little, but I had endured incredible heartbreak because of my uh, relationship with him. And he brought me over as the sea captain. Um, I was a 12-year-old girl coming over uh, with my, my stepmother, uh, who'd become our mother, and with my uh, four sisters. And we came over on, um, in 1623. And my father, Richard Warren, had been on the Mayflower in 1620. So that was my grandfather's point about, remember, you came over on one of the Mayflower ships. I didn't know they were a class of ships. I, did, I thought there was just the Mayflower. So what he'd said to me in college was exactly, exactly right. But I just had understood it the wrong way. I thought he meant genealogy wise. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot more literal for me. So I explained to my um, former boyfriend who had been Captain William Pierce, what had happened and that we had had this uh, clandestine relationship that was not appropriate and I was too young and I had never known that he was married and had children and I thought he loved me I thought he was coming back for me I thought he was going to ask for my hand in marriage and he never came back so what had happened is between the ages of of 12 and 18 Every time he came back to Plymouth Plantation, because he came many times because he was bringing supplies and trading and, and you know, the, the, the plantation was not able to stand on its own. So there did need to be some um, trading, trading with, with Europe. And I am one million percent in love with this man because I recognize him from when I first see him on, on the ship. Um, I recognize him as, as my soulmate. And I did look at his hands and I saw there was no wedding ring. And in my world, a married man always wore a ring. And I didn't know that men at sea, they married or not, they, they, they don't wear rings. They don't wear anything that's going to catch their hands because they can lose a finger. They can lose their life. You know, they can get caught up on something as they're working on the ships. It's very dangerous. So I didn't know that he was married and had children. So he then disappears when I'm an 18 year old in that lifetime and I am heartbroken. I just don't know what to do with it because he just stops coming and I don't know what's happened to him. And I don't know uh, for the rest of that lifetime. So I live into my 60s. Thankfully, I am able to heal it um, enough after about three years or so that I do uh, meet uh, someone new. Uh, Thomas Little came over um, on, a, on a ship as an adult, and he became actually the first barrister, the first um, attorney or, or lawyer um, for, for uh, Plymouth Plantation. And we uh, had a large family and just a lot of, a lot of joy, a lot of happiness. But I never forgot, um, as Ann Warren Little, I never forgot or fully got over uh, William Pierce. So uh, go forward to uh, my time in my, my death um, as, as Ann Warren Little, and I'm widowed. I'm newly widowed. I did not uh, take it very well. I had a lot of trouble adjusting. I was in my 60s. And Thomas was gone um, very suddenly. I had that large family, as I said, just so many children and, and, and grandchildren. And it's just big, big, big family because we'd had nine children. So the family tree is just getting very, very wide. Um, and 
spent my whole lifetime at Plymouth Plantation once I arrived there as a 12 year old. But what happens as I'm in my 60s and really very, very lonely without my husband. So I decide to get this a spunky uh, cat. I get this black um, Tom cat for company. And th this is wonderful. This is, you know, a good thing to have, just have someone to care for and, you know, someone, someone sassy in, in my life. And I wake up one morning around four o'clock in the morning because I can hear the cat just caterwauling, just really crying loudly outside the front door because he wants to come in. So I open the front door and I go, I like just take one step out onto that little, little tiny front stoop and I go down. Uh, Indian arrow um, in my uh, under my left lower ribs, and I go down. Um, Indian attack on the on the plantation, and I die uh, right there on my front stoop. Very suddenly, no preparation, no expectation that this was coming. I just was frantic. So I leave my body, but I don't. I don't go up to the light because I'm just beside myself. The cat is just caterwauling and just screaming all over my body. And I'm like frantically in my, my soul form running all over the plantation, trying to warn people, trying to, is my family okay? Can people get away? What's happened? I'm just out of my mind. And I don't, I don't go up to the light. The light opens, it comes down, I'm invited, I'm cajoled, I'm just encouraged. Every I won't leave. I won't leave because I was super, super stubborn. And the last thing that William Pierce had ever said to me um, when I was around 18, um, and I had just lost my father. My father had just passed on. So I was just just emotionally devastated from the sudden death of my father and the last thing that William um, had ever said to me and I thought he didn't ask for my hand in marriage that day um, to my stepmother because it was too soon after my father's death but the last thing he ever said to me was you're so special to me and I really care for you I'll be back for you and because I'd never seen him again um, from when I was 18 to my death in my uh, mid 60s, I think, oh, well, William never came back and he said he'd come back. And in my world, your word is your bond. So um, I thought, well, I'm, I'm supposed to wait for William. I'm not going to cross over to the light until William's here. And I never knew uh, in that lifetime that he had died years and years and years before. Uh, but I just, I just, I never knew it. So, and he was not meant to uh, come for me at that time. I was meant to um, go, go on up, up to the light, but I didn't. And I remained as that heartbroken, stubborn, stuck, emotional ghost and I had a lot of um, energy of uh, hell hath no fury, like a woman scorned. I was angry, just really, really angry that he hadn't followed through and he had never come back and there was no explanation. Uh, Cause again, that wasn't how in my mind things should work in life. Just, you know, very kind of, kind of rigid in the, in the thought process and in, in the upbringing, et cetera. So um, that's what happened. And then I actually was able to finally get my uber stubborn ghost to the light when I met my boyfriend in this lifetime who had been, had been um, Captain William Pierce and also had my uh, best friend from both then and, and now helping me saying, come on, girl, we got to clean this up. So I explained to my um, former boyfriend at that time, I mean, by 2013, I explained to him what had happened. He was very kind. I mean, to listen to this out there, wild, very detailed story. It took me an hour to fully explain the story to him and what had happened. And he just looked at me and he said, I don't remember it very much. I just remember the sea captain part many times, but I know you're telling the truth. I know it's I know it's valid for you. And I know I just I want to help you clean up this energy. So how do we do that? Just tell me how to help you. Tell me what to do. 
so we planned a ritual. I had never planned a ritual uh, in my life at that point. And we, I said, well, she evidently has a thing about midnight referring to Anne because all those times she'd woken me up right at midnight. So she's got some flair for the dramatic. And the way she'd woken my friend up right at midnight, I said, are you willing to pick a night when we can stay up until midnight and just call her in and talk to her and explain to her what happened and to just let her, she needs to forgive you. She needs to forgive herself. She needs to move on. Are you willing to do that with me? And he said, yes. So I was really grateful for that because it was so much easier to do it with the other person because he was he was taking responsibility for it which was very kind because as i said he didn't have a lot of direct memories of it but he just knew my uh big story was was true was true for me so we um got together at midnight and again she had some flair for the dramatic so i'm like well let's call her in it might be hard i don't know i've never done this before so i played uh don henley's song miss ghost <laughs> about got run over <laughs> it was like there 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 shannon the energy in that room we we did it from um, his home the energy in that room there were four of us there i mean clearly he's like oh wow so he was feeling it and sensing it too he says there's four of us here and i had um um i had been divorced for years but i just had dug out um my wedding ring and to go to go to the bank and get it out of the the safe deposit box and i'm like she just needs to understand and to see rings because she's hung up on the rings part too. And I'd asked him, I said, do you still have your wedding ring? Um, <laughs> Cause he'd been divorced for years. He's like, yeah, I think I can find it. And I said, will you please wear it? Cause I need to show her that you were married. I need to show her your wedding ring. So that became comical because he put it on and, you know, we did this whole ritual. And then when we were done, he went to take it off. He couldn't get it off. Right. <laughs> And I, I thought that was funny. Um, so I had to use a whole bunch of soap and <laughs> figure out how to get it back off. But we, we went through and explained to her and just showed her a lot of compassion, but a lot of firmness that it was time to go up to the light. She was just at the point of agreeing. And then he said something about um, his birthday party. He was going to be having a birthday party um, the next week. And she I mean, we were really right at the point where she was going up to the light. And I was like, yay, finally. Oh my gosh, I've been waiting for this for hundreds of years. Yay. And he said something about his birthday party and she immediately stopped going up to the light. She said, oh, I want to go to the party. And I'm, I'm looking at him. I'm like, no, 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 no. Tell her no, 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 no. I'm not having this ghost around for another week. I am done with this. He's like, oh, sure, she can come to the party. The more, the merrier. I'm like, what? You just invited my ghost that we just put all this effort into sending to the light. You just invited her to your party. What is wrong with you? <laughs> so it just, yeah, just like the energy just shut down. I, I couldn't get her to go. And he's like, no, nope, she can come to the party. So I had to then deal with her for another week. It was very uh, uncomfortable is very unpleasant because we're really arguing because I want her I've got the body hey I'm in charge here <laughs> you need to go so but we'd agreed to wait until his birthday party and then I discovered why she wanted a public apology and I didn't know that that was another hallmark of a ghost Often, if they feel wronged, if they feel angry, they want an apology and double, triple points if it's a public apology. So the way that occurred at the party, so he was hosting his own uh, 60th birthday party and it was in a local restaurant where he um, had a, a private room and we were sitting at a huge round table. We had probably uh, 20, 25 people around this big uh, round table. And uh, someone immediately to the right of me did the, you know, just because a lot of people didn't know each other. They're from all different walks of his life. And he'd ask people to uh, just prepare if they wanted to like give a toast or do a roast. He said, you know, no gifts, please. Just your company is enough. And just, um, you know, if there's anything you want to say, that would be wonderful. 
So the gal immediately to my right just, you know, stands up to get the party rolling when we're all seated. And she says, well, why don't we all say how we know uh, so-and-so, you know, the guest of honor? And I'm thinking, oh boy, this is going to get really interesting. Because I can see the party is comprised, and we overflowed that room. There were people in booths, there were people that didn't even fit. But I can see the party is 90% women. Uh, his two sons were there, uh, his best friend from college was there, and his best friend from grade school was there. They were the only, oh, and then one gal had brought her uh, boyfriend. No other men there, it's all women. And what starts happening as they go around the table, and I'm going to be last because it started to my right and it's going all the way around the table. How do you know the guest of honor? And what we discover is it's woman after woman after woman that has been a girlfriend, that's been a lover, that he's lived with, that he's dated. It's going on and on and on and on around the room. Well, I'm so angry like the top of my head is about to blow off <laughs> and I can just feel uh, the anger um, from this lifetime, from some other lifetimes, from some other experiences with them. And I'm like, I've got to release this in a healthy way. This is not good for me. I need to forgive him. I need to find a way to get closure on this and close this out. So when it got all the way around to me and I stood up, um, and what I said was, as Wendy, uh, evidently, I'm one more of um, his poor little match girls, uh, to, which got a big uh, roar of laughter from the crowd because a million of us had met him via match, via match.com. Mm -hmm. So I said, evidently, I'm one more, one more of the poor little match girls. <laughs> and, but, and then I just stood standing and I just waited for everyone to be quiet and this is not like me I just I don't normally have this energy but it was very clear what Anne wanted done and I said I'd like to read you um, a, 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 a toast a roast from a guest who couldn't be here tonight and this is for you from Anne and Anne is so sorry that she couldn't be here in the flesh tonight she was sure there and I read him uh, I, 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 I did a roast of him and then at the end of it, I just folded it up and, um, you know, handed it to him and gave it to him and he put it, put it, you know, in with the pile. And I had addressed it uh, to William um, from Anne. And as he stood there, he said, I'm, and, you know, he stood up to acknowledge um, what, what I had said as Anne. And he said, Anne was really, really special to me. And I'm so sorry that she can't be here tonight in person because I owe her a public apology. And that was all my ghost needed. That was what, that was what she wanted. So I just, you know, handed him the folded up note and it was just, just for him, but he, he understood what was, had been happening was very much on, on two levels from various lifetimes. And interestingly, Shannon, we had about um, three or four uh, friends um, in common that he'd invited to the party that night that had all said, no, I'm not going anywhere near that party. The energy is wacky. It's off the charts. And they said, Wendy, are you sure you're meant to go? Are you supposed to go to this party? It's going to be really, really hard on you because he's going to be there with his new girlfriend and some things are going to come to light that you might find really difficult. And I said, I know pretty much exactly what I'm walking into. I may not know the scope, but I'm meant to be there. I need to stand in my power. So I did. And it, it just worked out wonderfully because that's what had been missing was I was still this, you know, forlorn little ghost chasing after the man that doesn't want her, that isn't the appropriate choice that she needed to fully, fully uh, move, move on from and just forgive him, forgive myself and just get to the place where we could have a good laugh about it and say, wow, that was a pretty crazy experience. Um, but I just feel so, so fortunate to have had that fully, fully 
um, unwind uh, because he and I needed to master forgiveness. That was one of the major reasons that we met again. And we also had met back in the 1800s. We had a lovely, lovely lifetime together, uh, married and just uh, gentlemen, gentlemen farmers, uh, pretty easy to uh, earn our living. We were in Othello, Washington, so rural uh, Washington state back when it was uh, Oregon country and it wasn't um, part of Washington state yet. And we just had these delightful uh, neighbors and we traded, we would purposefully grow different things to uh, trade and did the same thing at Plymouth Plantation. You know, it's just a, it's just a great way to share and get fresh food is just, you know, grow it and trade with trade with neighbors and people, people near you. But in that 1800s life, and we'd scripted it really well, um, just a lovely, lovely uh, lifetime. Um, and we were both, uh, we were both writers. In fact, all four of us were writers and just, you know, really um, enjoying that. No children. So had plenty of time to deal with this ghost situation and just to have cleaned it up. That's why we came in in that lifetime. But we never woke up spiritually. <laughs> right. They're one of us. So we, we, didn't, we didn't get the job done. But, you know, our souls are eternal and we're just going to keep working on it. Well, okay, that didn't work. That's okay. Let's debrief. What did we learn? What do we let go of? What do we bring in more of? You know, you go home and you just debrief it all. And then you're like, okay, here's how we'll arrange it a different way. You know, this time we're going to be boyfriend and girlfriend and we're going to wake up. And we're going to really figure it out. And that's what finally happened this lifetime. So my point is you literally can be haunting yourself and I think we often do we just don't realize how hard we're being on ourselves that we haven't forgiven ourselves or haven't forgiven other people we're just carrying these old flames or these old baggage with us it doesn't make any sense anymore and it's time to just let it go my goodness so for me to be able to let it go, I literally had to write an entire book. So I wrote um, The Flow One uh, Plymouth Plantation and it was um, so much energy came forward and it was like, Anne was just dictating to me from that lifetime. Okay, this happened and then this happened and then this happened. And Shannon, I'll be honest, I am not great at history. And I think that's actually kind of perfect because it came through to me without me looking things up. And also I'm Canadian, so I don't know colonial American history very well. I knew kind of the basics, but I, you know, just the level of detail um, that came through was, was pretty, pretty amazing. And one other incredible thing that happened was I had a past life healing session with a past life regressionist during this time period when I was trying to really uh, heal and release this energy from that lifetime. And I didn't say a word to her about, um, you know, what I was, what I was struggling with, but I went straight into that lifetime during the past life regression. And I spoke as Anne Warren Little for over an hour. That's where a lot of the detail came from that was in the book. And then just, you know, adding to that, you know, things that happened before and after and other experiences. But what happened during that past life regression, it was in my home. And um, the therapist didn't really care for animals. So I said, okay, no problem. We'll lock my kitty uh, out of the room because I don't want you have to, you know, deal with someone else's cat. And we'll just, we'll just lock him out and, and do, do the session. So she was happy with that. So I lock him out or so I think. Well, what actually happened was he had, I thought I um, had him out of the room, but he'd actually hidden in the walk-in closet and I didn't know he was in there. So he was in, um, he was in the, the, the primary suite with us with the door closed during the session. So the session went on for several hours. And at the very end of it, when I'm speaking as Anne Warren Little and I'm putting together the pieces of, of the death scene and what had happened. And I'm like, I opened the door and my cat was just, you know, caterwauling all over my, my dying body. And my cat came streaking into the bedroom, just screaming at the top of his lungs. The therapist, I give her a lot of credit because again, not an animal lover, but she just turned over to him and she's like, and she started addressing him as if he was the client. She said, midnight you're just fine. 
That's a long time ago. You didn't do anything wrong. She would have died that day anyway. That was just her day to go home. It's not your fault. Um, you're a good kitty. You can just let it go. Because I had just said, oh my gosh, that's what brought him running into the room. I said, oh my gosh, I have the same cat. Mm -hmm. It's the same cat I had at Plymouth Plantation. And Shannon, I had worked with behaviorists. I'd worked with the vet. I'd worked with so many people. I said, my cat has this really bad habit. He's insistent. And he was a house cat. Um, he's insistent on trying to burst out of the front door, but when he does, he doesn't go anywhere. He's just wild on the front porch. He just screams at the top of his lungs and he's like looking around like crazy. Well, he was looking around for an attack. Yeah. He never did it again after my past life regression session. So he got healed. And I thought that's another huge validation that that, that is the same cat. And that animals can also heal um, from their past lives and that they can have been with us in other, other lives. So just so many um, lessons and beautiful things came up as a result of this. So what, what questions do you have? I know that's a lot. Thank you for letting me share all that. Yeah, I was actually just going to say... Um... All of the questions I had, you answered, which I appreciate, um, except that I'm going to share something that I just that for us to talk about for a minute, um, because my questions were, how did that relationship play out in this life, which or how did you play out that pain in this life? And you you address that and you can elaborate on it, too, with not just with your partner at the time, uh, who to whom you were a match girl. But just was that a theme in your life or was it just the way you played things out with him? That's a great question. I absolutely came into this lifetime with a lot of karma as a heartbreaker and also being very heartbroken uh, romantically. Yet it was very, very important to me. You know, nothing mattered more um, few things mattered more in life than, you know, really having that wonderful, uh, loving, loving partner, romantic partner. And it's been a very challenging journey. So the way it played out in particular with, with that um, soulmate was he had the contract to wake me up spiritually, which he did when we started, when we first met back in 2010 uh, via match. And we then uh, dated exclusively and it was highest highs, it was lowest lows. There was so much wonderful about it, but Shannon, it was intense off the scales. It didn't make sense to me why it was so loaded. And it just was, um, it became It became not good for me. Mm -hmm. It became not a, not a um, healthy relationship at all. He ended it um, when we had been, uh, dating for 13 months, he ended it via email, which again, made me super uh, angry. And we then, um, after, after cooling off for a couple of days, I did uh, call him and said, got your uh, email. Uh, I agree. We cannot and should not be dating um, that this needs to be done. Uh, but I'd like to, can we meet for coffee? Because I have a couple things I'd like to ask you, a couple things I'd like to say, and you got the benefit. You sent me a two-page, mm -hmm. perfectly formatted, perfect. You got to say everything you wanted to say, and I said, "I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not. I don't want to pick a fight." I agree, it's Jen, but we also need to return some things to each other. Are you comfortable with that? And meet for coffee. Uh, and he said, "Yes." And I could tell he was concerned and friends were uh, very concerned um, and said, uh, Wendy, he's not going to show up. You need to prepare yourself for that. And I said, I'm okay with however, however it plays out, but he did come and Shannon, that turned into one of the best three hour conversations of my life. Um, yes. so it was very interesting when we first met the first lunch we ever had together and it had started online and a three hour lunch where we just couldn't stop finishing each other's sentences and realized mm -hmm. we had so much uh, 
energy together and much of it was wonderful. We found 21 past lives together. Uh, six of them married, uh, just many, many, but also a lot of uh, a lot of junk, a lot of betrayal, a lot of really tough stuff, some beautiful stuff serving in the silent uh, um, uh, monasteries together. Uh, we just found so much. It took us eight years uh, to work through all that because we did, um, once I had um, healed the most profound part of the heartbreak, which honestly, it took a couple of years because uh, it was so, so profound. Um, we, we became spiritual seekers together. And I said, I need just really clean boundaries, you know, just meet casually once in a while, coffee, lunch, that sort of thing. Um, because we're still, we're still healing and releasing things together. Um, are you willing to do that? And he said, yes, you know, however, however it's comfortable for you, whatever, you, you know, you, you, you lead. Um, so, so I did. And um, it just had so many things roll out. I was able to learn through that relationship with him. I was able to learn what soul contracts are and how to read those. And that was amazing. So his first contract, um, our first contract together was him to wake me up spiritually. Awesome. I was ready for it. It was amazing. And the second contract was to break my heart repeatedly until I stood in my power fully without abusing it. That is a brilliant contract, but obviously very difficult. And no one should stay in a relationship where they're having their heart broken repeatedly. And that's absolutely what was happening um, for me. Um, because yes, during our time together, he was uh, being true and exclusive because that's what I needed and wanted and required, but it was not his energy. And he just... Um, you know, he ended it saying very truthfully, I just need to go play the field. I just mm -hmm. need to go do a lot of other things. I need to have some big adventures and I know it's going to break your heart. So we need to end it and end it now. So um, it, it was a gift to me, but it, it took me a while to uh, unpack that gift. So being able to understand that contract and for me to be able to heal all my energy when I had been the heartbreaker and had not been kind to people and had not been considering how they felt and how they felt about me. And it just really, really needed some cleanup for me to be pristine um, in, my, in my relationships with, with other men romantically. So I worked and worked and worked to do that and make sure I was. And then I started healing from all these very challenging uh, romantic relationships that I've had in this lifetime. And the part about standing in my power fully, because at first, and I knew exactly what it meant. And you can hear that and you can think, oh, that means dial it back. You know, you're, you're doing too much. You're taking advantage of your power. And for me, it was the opposite. I had uh, multiple um, 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 counts of karma because I worked with a spiritual numerologist and she helped me figure this out with precision for having abused my power. So what I was doing in this lifetime was I didn't want to do that again and I didn't trust myself. So I was just the shrinking violet and I wasn't helping people with my spiritual gifts and abilities because I was afraid of stepping to the plate and coming out publicly and getting, getting um, punished for it again, getting tortured for it again, getting killed for it again. And I just didn't want to go through that again, but that's not the time we're in. That's not the time and place we live in now. So I was just shirking, um, shirking and not, not um, helping myself enough, not helping other people enough by standing fully in my power. So he knew that. And he would just say to me, step up, girl, you know how to do this, you know, do it now, take care of business now. And he kept encouraging me, let go of what other people think it has nothing to do with you. And you need to free yourself up. And I would learn years later, after he'd said that to me instinctively, multiple times, I would learn years later, I'm a life path 33. And a big part of the life path 33 journey is let go of what other people think. <laughs> that checks out. So it just, you yeah. know, it made, it made perfect sense. So thank you. Yeah, that's interesting. Your 
completely. It's very interesting. And that's, you answered it perfectly. That was my question. Um, and then I just wanted to share, and I know you're a past life progressionist, so we'll have links below about how to get in touch with you for, you're still doing that, right? Like oh, absolutely. for people, perfect. It, just making sure, because we haven't talked in a while. Um, my pleasure. Yes. So I work with uh, clients so regularly and just so love helping people be able to let go of the energy that doesn't serve them. Because you probably know, um, Shannon, being a psychic medium, yeah that people can just be carrying this pain, uh, physical and emotional, uh, can be carrying uh, anxiety, depression, stuck energy, just not able to move forward and align with their purpose and not able to bring in the resources that they need. They're just not fully in their power. They're not grounded to earth. They're not trusting their connection with the divine. So um, that's what I- uh, That's what you do. Enjoy helping people uh, get to that place um, where they're able to do those things and live live a uh, feeling just a lot healthier and happier and that their life does have that beautiful purpose and they can live it so well said and we'll also have a link to your book below um oh, your cool. books you have yeah but um i wanted to share too because i thought it would be of interest to the audience but i'd love to hear i mean you may not have specific thoughts I recently, I had some, I have someone in my life and there's just this thing where we don't, we've had out of body experiences together. We've been in each other's dreams. We've, it, it's just been this ongoing. Energy. Yeah. There's this, we're it, this thing that, it, and so I went into a meditation about it to say, what is this person to me? Um, or who I've tried these past life regressions on myself. They've never worked. Mm -hmm. I went into a meditation and I saw myself looking at same theme, looking out a window, feeling like someone had left on a ship. I assumed at the time it was my partner, my husband. I was crying. I knew I was Swedish. I just, I, I just knew I was Swedish. Okay, that could be a dream. So then I heard Jacques. And then I heard, I saw, I saw in my mind's eye, 52, and I heard battalion. So it felt really real. I could mm -hmm. feel I, well, I came out of it crying. I went to Google after this and I looked up Jacques, 52nd Battalion. George Jacques was the commander of the 52nd Battalion in World War II. Yeah. And I started to research him. And uh, at first I assumed I might've been his wife and that he had gone to fight and I was waiting for him and crying. But I, I looked up his wife. I reached out to... I. Facebook post, uh, that's how I found out about her. I reached out to her niece and she was like, well, my aunt only died. She died like recently. It wasn't even, I mean, she was like in her nineties or something like that. And uh, so it probably wouldn't have been her that you were reincarnated as because she's, she only died within the last, whatever, 10 years. But then I was doing more research and I saw that sort of the nanny of this guy was from Sweden and she lived with the family and there was no information about her. As you said, if you weren't the elite, there's not going to be much on you. Um, it wasn't a super long time ago, but long enough ago where she was just a sort of a servant. Um, but she did, she was Swedish. She did live with the family. So I always had had this feeling that this person and I might've been, I know we could have been different genders, but I just had a feeling of mother and son like a lot in our interactions that, that has this feeling of, I've always thought, I wonder if I was his mother or something, right. because there's this like, there's this bolus of different uh, lives yeah. together. Um, I, I recently uh, had a wonderful, um, wonderful, uh, just marvelous man um, that I was dating and we found, I found, cause it really wasn't his cup of tea. He was very respectful. He would listen with interest but just not his cup of tea because he just wasn't in the past life energy lane he didn't need yeah. to be there 24 lives together so absolutely there can be different roles yeah so when you first I'm sure speaking i just was i just was hearing not his wife not his wife and i was like okay daughter unrequited love nanny makes makes perfect it sense. does because there would be that love yeah. between sort of a care I've been a nanny my whole life it's a forbidden, and, it's a forbidden love so it's very yeah. powerful 
because it's it's an unrequited love and that's why mine was so powerful as that ghost because it just it just the energy wasn't wasn't clean and clear around it it just it was a married man that she did not know was married and it just it was not it just it went sideways <laughs> yeah that's so interesting too and i i i really that sort of clicked for me because we kept saying, what's, what is this? What, why do we keep having these weird spiritual experiences? And, um, I'd it's, focus on yeah. now. Yeah. Really? What relationship are we meant to have now? What would be amazing and wonder if any, you yeah, know, leave it open for now and just really ground yourself and be in the present day and time. And then as little thing, if, you know, if you do continue, um, in, in relationship together, as little things come up, you'll be able to clear them. And depending on his belief system, you can choose yeah. to uh, talk with them or not, because he may or may not, you know, feel them or be impacted by them. Exactly. But thank you for sharing that advice with me and the audience. It's, it's interesting um, where there's, yeah, it's a very interesting friendship, mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's, I, I feel, yeah. And there's a lot of like, it has a sort of this really unresolved, strange energy around it. So right. I right. think it makes perfect sense. And I, I, he's also an out of body experiencer. And so I, I know that, and, and very psychic. So I think it's, it's something we could talk about. I just haven't wanted, you know, it's like, you don't want to overwhelm someone with absolutely the depth of it. So you, it's, you can yeah, go, you can go little bitty pieces, Yeah, and, you know, see, see if they're open to it. And then you don't, it doesn't have to turn into <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot to dump on someone. It's it's even though we already discussed that we know we've lived past lives. It's uh, we just had we were like, I know you already. Something we both kind of went like this, right, right. You there, meet yeah, someone that it, it's more than deja vu. It's just it like, is like I know you, I know you. Yep. And it can be this feeling of like, oh, I can't wait to catch up. Yeah. Then, wait a minute, we met fifteen seconds ago. Yeah. You know, so that's that that past. It's interesting. Movie. It's so um, fascinating, and I, I I love I love talking about this. And in fact, my last thing I'll say is, this morning I felt I I, without even you in mind, I I leave I do shorts for uh, on YouTube, and on on social media for the podcast, and uh, this is my last question to you is I I talked about how people have asked me as a medium, well, how can you connect with my grandmother if people reincarnate? And my explanation was that on the other side or whatever other dimension, there's no time. So we are actually in this linear, in this 3D, we have linear time. And so we will say, oh, I lived in 1600. I lived in a different, but in fact, from what I understand, and I want to hear your thoughts on it, is that there is no time. So all of these lives are happening simultaneously at the same time. So it's like the movie, everything, everywhere, all at once, where from a, a quantum physics perspective, I, I'm not living in the past. I'm actually also living that life now, in exactly. a sense. And it's, so that's why your ghost could haunt you now. I, that's yes, what I was going to ask you. Yes, yeah, exactly. Because it is all in the now. And it's a human construct. And it's a very good one, because we need to kind of simplify time for our human brains. So we have we've chosen as our construct past, present, future. But time is not really a line like that time is is as you said much more much more quantum it's much more of a loop uh versus you know versus a line where it is all happening in the now and um because you, you'd mentioned you couldn't have been have been the end right because of the overlap of time well that was my whole objection to why i couldn't have been a certain person um, which is actually my next my next book, because I knew we'd been alive at the same time for 40 years. But it's still it's actually okay. Well, listen, because I this this is what I'd love to hear. I looked up his wife. She was an actor, so am I. Um, she was her name was Betty. In college, that was my nickname. Mm -hmm. And it was my nickname for no other reason than my friend said, Your name isn't Shannon, it's Betty. And she said, and she told everybody my name was Betty. And I'm like, for no reason, just, she goes, you, you, you look like a Betty, you remind me of a Betty. And she told everyone. So people would like literally think that was my name. They didn't know that it wasn't. So everywhere I went and I had, uh, was, uh, 
was some shirt we had with like a number on the back and it said Betty on it. So people would always, <laughs> that was my, that's what people called me in college. So I, as I'm saying that I'm getting really big chills. So it's like, maybe I could have been, I don't know about the Swedish thing. I'm not, I'm not, everything is very confusing to me in that sense, but there was this sense okay. of well, like, started out beautiful. yeah, I was like, the, I feel like I'm so drawn to this woman, Betty, but then she was alive at the same time, but I kind of have considered don't, that. Don't, don't discount don't, it. Don't it, rule it out. Yeah. It can be a, a past parallel life. And that does take us down that beautiful rabbit hole of everything is simultaneous. And I love that. Quantum and everything's really in the now. And I do agree with you that time is different on the other side. It's a timeless, spaceless place. Yeah. Everything in the now. So we're starting to wrap our heads around that, um, you know, and again, science and spirituality are coming together in nice ways with, 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 you know, wormholes and quantum entanglement and, and just, you know, what you're thinking about is being created more and it's just um, making sense. Fascinated by ways. that stuff. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your story and your insight and your wisdom. And I hope that people will reach out to Wendy to work with her. I mean, there's so much to discover. And I thank you for reaching out to me and, and wanting to share your story on my podcast. I'm so honored. So uh, you're you're so delightful. I just adore you. Oh, well, likewise, Shannon. Well, my absolute pleasure. And I can be reached via my website, which is wendyrosewilliams.com. And listeners are welcome to uh, go there and look for, uh, I do offer ongoing complimentary energy healings, group energy healings, as well as different workshops. And there's also the information regarding working together privately one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you so much, Wendy Rose Williams. Thank you.